state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live on Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local show times, visit category5.tv. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you joining me. I'm Robbie Ferguson, the host of the show, the founder of the show, the producer of the show, and the only guy here. Because, hey, this is we're, we're all just doing our best, aren't we, throughout this wild time in the history of our planet and our race. And uh, here I am at Category 5 Technology TV's Studio E, going in alone once again this week. However... My wife, Becca, is here again this week, pre-recorded for our newsroom segment, and I'm looking forward to having her join us in a little bit, uh, a little bit of time as, we, as the show goes on. Um, I just want to say that this broadcast would not be possible. Our studio would not be possible without the support of our Kickstarter uh, backers, our patrons, and the donors uh, who have simply decided to throw a little something in the tip jar. In particular, I want to say thank you to Scott, Ber S Scott Barkley. Pardon me, Scott. I apologize. <laughs> Scott Barkley. Ron Bow. Thank you guys so very much. Jerry Kowalski. Thank you for your support. Jonathan Garby as well. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you and I appreciate your support. Jens Nissen. Uh, thank you, Jens, and I appreciate you supporting Category 5 Technology TV. Bo Leknowski, thank you, sir. You know I appreciate you so very much. And Bill Marshall, same goes for you, my man. Uh, thank you for your support of Category 5 Technology TV. It's folks like this, like these people who I've mentioned, um, who just have decided to back up Category 5 Technology TV and see us through what could have been a very, very difficult time. None of us saw the pandemic coming. I mean, we all knew that there was stuff going on, but to this extent, uh, to the fact that, hey, we moved in the midst of this, and then suddenly um, we're basically on lockdown, and I'm here doing my level best to set things up and get a show operational for you. And it's taking time, and it will take time to get back to our normal self. Of course, the team can't be here with me, and, and I'm, really, I'm really digging the idea of having Jeff and Henry come back to, uh, to our live broadcast and, and being here in our new space. I mean, this is going to be all very novel for them. They're going to be here at our new studio for the very first time, um, other than, you know, Jeff was here on move day, but I mean, that was just boxes, but now things are actually starting to come together. So, but thank you to those of you who have supported this project and this show after, you know, 12, 13 years of broadcasting almost every single week with very few exceptions, um, it's really cool to know that you back us up and that uh, you want to see this show go on. And it's going on, e even if it's not exactly the way it's going to be three, four months from now. But I'm doing, uh, I'm doing everything to bring you a great show every single week. So thank you so very much for being here. Before we jump into the show today, I want to remind you to subscribe to us on YouTube. You can click that bell as well. That's going to make sure that you get the notifications every time we are live or any time that we post new videos, which is pretty regularly now, uh, now that we're back. So you want to get the notifications for that. I'm sitting here in my production room. We call this the bridge. And in this production studio, there's a lot of ambient noise. And it really, now that we're in our new space and I have a separate studio space for the show to broadcast from, it's amazing how much noise you hear when you're in this room because you don't hear it in the other room. And I say that because in our previous studio, Studio D, 
All these things were in the same room as the cameras and the microphones and everything else. So that ambient noise that you're hearing right now, we used to have to deal with that every single week. There's going to be a time coming when we no longer have to deal with that. And part of that is doing my best to reduce the noise. Now, the main studio area, there's no noise. There's, I'm, I'm not allowing any moving parts in that room. There are no moving parts. That is fantastic. Think about that for a second from a broadcast perspective, from a studio perspective. I don't allow any motors or fans or anything else in that room. Everything's got to be either passive or SSD, that kind of stuff. So with that in mind, I do sometimes have to work in here and I do have to, as you're seeing this week and last, sometimes I have to broadcast from this space too. And it'll be cool when we have everything set up the way it's going to be and, and this can be a bit of a studio as well that I can broadcast maybe some tips and show you how broadcasting works and, and I know one of the features that we're going to be doing is demonstrating and, and showing you how I produce a show every single week in DaVinci Resolve uh, combined with Telestream Wirecast, our task cam over here and everything. you're going to get to know how everything works so this room will be a, a big part of that but there's a lot of room noise. Room noise is the enemy of video broadcasters, podcasters, radio, room noise is the worst. We always have to deal with, you know, in the next studio, I don't have the ambient noise of motors and fans and things, but I do have echo right now that I have to deal with. So we'll deal with that with some, uh, some sound, uh, soundproofing and, and some foam that, uh, that will help with that. Putting up drapes and things will also assist with that and uh, inevitably getting some furniture in that's not just solid wood will be helpful as well because there's a lot of echo. But in this room, you can hear there's a lot of ambient noise from the server rack that's behind me. It's really important. That runs the show. It keeps everything going. It runs a lot of our services and our, our internal infrastructure. However, it is generating a lot of noise and a fair bit of heat. This is the warmest room in the house, I'll tell you that. But it's pretty noisy. And so what I've done this week oh, is I have set down a H4N. This is a Zoom H4N, which I've got on a tripod or a mic stand here. This is recording uh, with a mic sensitivity of 40. So the, the volume level, if you have an H4N, I've got this set to 40. So it's picking up the ambient noise right now. It's not broadcasting to you. I'm going to switch to this microphone in just a second, but um, it's picking up that ambient noise so that we can um, see those levels. I've turned off the auto mic levels uh, on the H4N. So what you're going to get to hear and see visually in gold wave are the wavetables directly from this with no uh, resampling and no changes to the levels. So it's exactly the same from point A to point B. I mean, there, it's not going to change the levels of the microphone. That's going to help us to be able to see tonight what kind of a difference we can make by changing a simple fan. Can a $10 part reduce the noise in such a way that it's actually worth our while? So this is our backup drive. It's an A-RAID 3500-GP. These things are fantastic. It's a mirroring unit. So we've got a master drive and a secondary drive, and I can pull this secondary drive. It's a, a 10 terabyte um, hard drive. I pull that out, pop in a different one, and it re-images, and I have a, an exact mirror at all times of my backup. Then the server is down here, and this is actually the storage and the Samba shares and everything else. And that's generating a lot of noise too. So right now, let's just check out the levels of everything running the way it normally would. I'm going to shut up for a second and let you hear that and see that visually. Okay, so that's the ambient noise just coming off of everything, the server, the backup, everything running. I'm going to halt the server, which I've just done. Let's listen. Waiting for it to shut down. 
and it's still powered on, so I'm going to now power that off. Here we go. Okay, so with the server off, there is a notable difference. But there's still a lot of noise coming off just the backup unit. All right, so I'm going to power that off and we'll see how the room sounds. What a difference, eh? Okay, so let's get this out of the way. And I'm going to actually remove this backup drive. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to throw a, a little $9 fan in here to replace the stock fan. And the intention today it's not a sophisticated tutorial or anything like that. It's not overly geeky. However, something that we don't often think about is that there are very simple and very affordable solutions that we can put into place that can help with this ambient noise. It doesn't just apply for me here at the studio. It applies for you at home. Uh, if you've got computers that maybe are generating a lot more noise than they uh, need to be, Maybe a solution is to look at those fans and see if you can cut that down. Look at the hard drives and say, hey, I've got a lot of spinning hard drives in there right now. Let's instead replace those with some Kingston SSDs, which are they have no moving parts and they make absolutely no noise. They also, incidentally, generate less heat, which is a nice bonus as well. So this backup unit is generating, in my opinion, way more noise than I should be having from a backup unit. I mean, it's, it's my backup. It's incredibly important. However, it is just my backup. It's just two hard drives spinning away. Can't be generating that much heat that it has to be running a fan at full, capa uh, full spinning speed all the time. So the fan that I got is a pretty popular one. It's an Arctic F8 Silent. So do keep in mind, it is the silent model. And it says on the box, extra quiet fan. And you can see on the back of this unit, um, it does have a fan to keep it, everything cool. So that's what we're going to be replacing. I feel like maybe the stock fan is louder than it has to be. You guys could hear that. You could see that visually, how much ambient noise this thing was generating. It's really, really easy to do this kind of, it's not even a repair. It would be a repair if the original fan wasn't, uh, wasn't working. In this case, I'm replacing a working fan, but it's just a noisy fan. All right, so what do we have here? We've got, some, we've got a tie wrap here that I'm going to have to cut. I don't even have the correct tools yet, like scissors or wire snips. Do not do this at home. I'm going to be really careful. I'm going to say that and then I'm going to cut my finger real bad. I'm not. I'm not. Don't worry. Don't do this. Don't ever do this. I just am going to get in so much trouble for doing that. I know. <laughs> Give me a hard time, YouTube. All right. So there is the fan, and this is the Molex connector for that fan. Ideally, if I could take this outside and blow it out with, uh, with a, a canless air, something like that, that would be ideal because there's a lot of dust in there too. Wow. Alright, so let's get into here. So simple, folks. But the ultimate test is going to be, I want to know we've got that recorder recording so that we can compare the actual ambient noise that this is generating. When you get a fan, you can look at the fan and it will show you, because you wonder which, which way is the fan going to be blowing. And I would have thought the fan was blowing out this way. But if you look really, really closly, let's see if you can get a fix on that. 
Can you guys see that? There's actually an arrow which points the way that the fan is going to be blowing. So that's important to note. It's exactly the opposite of what I would have thought. So easy install. And what I did is I just, I measured first and this is an uh, 80 millimeter. So um, it was easy enough to find online. And as I say, it was nine bucks to get a, a hold of this fan. So let's get that in there. I'm just gonna use the same screws. It came with screws too, but it doesn't matter, they're the same. So I'm hoping this is gonna make enough of a difference here in this room that uh, my $9 is well spent. The A-RAID 3500 is, is a great backup drive. Check it out. I'll put links below. Um, this one was gifted to me, um, which was a real blessing, um, by one of our long-term, uh, long-time friends of the show, who unfortunately went out of business. And they said, hey, would you like that? backup drive and so they gifted it to us and I've used it ever since and it's wonderful. These are great devices. Okay, so you notice I had a Molex on the old fan but I've got a three pin on this fan. So I've also grabbed myself a Molex to three pin adapter. So just pop your fan in there and that's just for the A-RAID because I knew that the A-RAID was using Molex. And here we go. Come on, these adapters can be a beast. There. Not really. Just gotta line them up right. Okay. So let's put this on. I'm not gonna screw it all together just now, just for the sake of good TV, because uh, that's not really all that exciting. But even without the screws, we're gonna have exactly the same ambient noise as with the screws. I don't think that's gonna affect the accuracy whatsoever of our test. So I'm going to just put this back on my server rack, plug in the SATA cable, eSATA, which just goes in the back here, if I can find it. Ah, I wasn't even in the right place. There we are. And it's a full-size power cable, just like a computer uh, cable. And if we're ready, now this is still recording. I'm going to place it right at the exact same spot and fire up. What a difference. Oh my goodness. I have to actually make sure that this is working. And it is, sure enough, she's blowing air. Beautiful. All right, I am gonna fire back up the server because the server generated a lot of noise too. And there's not a lot I can do about that. It's an R510, they're pretty noisy servers, but let's fire it up just so that I can compare the ambient noise difference. You can hear that the backup drive alone, huge difference. Now let's fire back up the server. This can get loud for a second because they fire up loud. Still notably quieter, but let's wait for it because these servers will those fans are going to calm down in a moment. They blow out the dust and everything before, uh, as they're just first booting up. Once the drives start flashing, that means it's booting. It's still pretty loud, but it's nowhere near. And here, you can hear it winding down.
I can at least. And there she goes. Starting the boot up process. So once it's finished booting, we'll have a pretty good impression as to the difference that this has made. For nine bucks. I'm gonna also be doing the same thing. You remember that my laptop computer um, had a really noisy fan, my ThinkPad. And so I've also ordered a replacement fan for that which has arrived. I haven't gotten into that, but while we're waiting for that to boot. So like this is a really simple fix that you can just do for a lot of your devices. I mean, who would have thought your backup drive even? Let's get into this box though and see what they've sent me. And there we are. There it is. So that's the cooling system for my laptop. And that's going to make that same amount of difference for, uh, for my laptop computer. So you can get these kind of replacement parts and you don't have to replace a whole laptop or a whole backup drive to reduce the ambient noise. So now I'm going to switch back to this microphone so that we can hear with the server running, the backup drive running, how does this compare to when I first started this segment? It's still booting. It's doing a lot of reading, so it might be a little bit inaccurate. Let's there, you can hear that. It's slowing down. Let's give it just another split second here. You can see the drives are going crazy, so that means it's still in the boot process. What a difference there. I'm going to, in post-production, I'm going to just go back over. Uh, so this is the A-RAID drive by itself, just the backup, servers off, all by itself before I replace the fan. And here it is after I replace the fan. And here they are side by side, those wavetables, just so you can see the, the difference in the ambient noise. All right, so that server is still booting, still going through its thing. But let's, uh, let's get a look at how the uh, ambient noise all together now. So the server and the backup drive are back up and running just like they were before. How is that affected? So the verdict, for nine bucks, for nine bucks, we brought down the ambient noise quite noticeably here in the production studio. It's something, I mean, we all have computers sitting next to us and sometimes they're louder than they need to be and sometimes we don't even realize it. But listen to your computer and s just see, hey, could this be a little bit quieter? And maybe replacing the CPU fan or as I say, switching out from a spinning hard drive to a, an SSD from Kingston Technology. Uh, something like that would make a huge difference to the ambient noise in the room and it just makes things so much better. For broadcast, it's going to be a lot better now. That's a noticeable difference. It's not perfect. There's still You can still hear the server, but the backup drive is no longer creating the uh, unbelievable amounts of noise that it, uh, that it was. Well, there you have it. You, you can look up um, your products online. I mean, get on to uh, b and Photo Video is a great place to get stuff. Um, also, Ameridroid has a lot of great fans. Um, I've got some fans um, for my server case that I'm going to put in from Ameridroid. Um, just check what they've got. You can find them at like pretty much any online store has got this stuff. So uh, really, really cheap, really, really easy to replace. And we did it here. So. Uh, we're ready to head over to the newsroom. So Becca, over to you. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Kernel security updates fix several issues in Ubuntu. LibreOffice 6.3.6 .6 is the final update to 6.3, which is going EOL. Sophos Firewall falls victim to the In the Wild SQL injection attack. Revolutionary new tech means you can touch things in VR. And 
Google has released the AI code for Tapas as open source software. Stick around, the full details in this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category5.tv Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Canonical has published new Ubuntu Linux kernel security updates for all of its supported releases to patch several vulnerabilities discovered lately by various security researchers. Affecting Linux 4.15, 4.4 and 5.3 kernels in several versions of Ubuntu Linux, the new security patch fixes an issue found in the Intel Wi-Fi driver, a race condition discovered in Linux kernel's virtual terminal implementation a flaw discovered in the floppy driver, and a race condition in the block I.O. tracing implementation. All these issues could allow a local attacker to either crash the system or expose sensitive information. The new kernel update also patches a stack buffer overflow discovered in the vhostnet driver. This could allow a local attacker with the ability to perform I.O. CTL calls on dev vhost.net to cause a denial of service crashing the system. That's just to name a few of the critical security issues that have been patched. Canonical urges all users to update their installations and install the new kernel versions as soon as possible. New kernel versions are also available for Raspberry Pi devices, cloud environments, OEM processors, Snapdragon processors, as well as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure Cloud, Oracle Cloud, Google Cloud Platform, and Google Container Engine systems. Keep in mind when updating a production system that a system reboot is required for the security issues to be corrected, so it's best to schedule a short downtime to perform this update. The Document Foundation has announced the release of LibreOffice 6.3.6 .6 as the sixth and final update of the 6.3 series, which will reach end of life at the end of this month. Coming more than two months after LibreOffice 6.3.5, the LibreOffice 6.3.6 .6 update is here to provide users of the LibreOffice 6.3 series with one last set of bug and regression fixes. It also aims to improve document compatibility. The LibreOffice 6.3 series is targeted at enterprise deployments and production environments. When LibreOffice 6.4 is already available, 6.3 is the only, only version currently recommended by the Document Foundation for organizations. That said, LibreOffice 6.3 is set to reach end of life on May 29, 2020, and this is the last update. If you're running LibreOffice 6.3 in your organization, it would be best to update to version 6.3.6 .6 as soon as possible and start considering upgrading your 6.3 installations to the 6.4 series in the coming weeks. The current release of LibreOffice is uh, 6.4.3, which will be considered ready for enterprise deployment by the next point release, which should be out by the end of the month. Until then, you can get either version from now, or you can get either version now from the official LibreOffice website. Binaries are provided for Deb and RPM-based distros, or you can install the latest release from the stable software repositories of your Linux distribution. Welcome back to the Crypto Corner. Hope you're all well. Um, today we'll only have two headlines. The first one will be the halving, and the second one will be DCEP. Now the halving occurs every 210,000 blocks, or roughly every four years, and reduces the block subsidy, so the money that the miners are getting, by around 50%. Currently that is 12.5 uh, Bitcoin every 10 minutes, and it will be reduced to 6.25 um, after around the 12th of May. As you can see behind me, <clears throat> there is a clock. The upper time is based on the current block time. So it takes around 8.8 .8 minutes, not 10 minutes, to mine a block. And the reason is that everybody that has got an ASICS miner switched that machine on to take advantage of the current still 12.5 Bitcoin that the system uh, emits every around 10 minutes or currently every 8.5 minutes. So you have to watch the upper time because that is the one that counts. There is no time within the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, it's just a block. And every block, as I said, takes around 10 minutes to be mined. 
And so there's this time difference coming from. Now, um, how do you say it correctly? Is it having or halvening? I was asked, well, you can use both. Um, in, the, in the blockchain itself, in the code, it says halving. It's hardwired in there, hard-coded in there. And if you want to take a look into that, also the 210,000 blocks is hard-coded in there. You go into github.com, then into the blockchain uh, uh, GitHub, and there into the set, uh, directory SCR, and there you search for a file called validate.cpp. Uh, in there, you just do a control F to find, uh, to search for uh, uh, having, and you'll find it there. And you'll find also the formula in there. And the other one with the 210,000 blocks, you'll find in a, in a file called chainparms.cpp. And um, the other question is, okay, what happens after the, uh, let's say, that's 12th of May or 11th of May, whenever that halving happens, will the Bitcoin uh, system crash? No, it won't, because it's not the first time. It's not the third time that this happens. <clears throat> and, um, and the miners that have got old machines or not operating uh, economically anymore will just switch off their machines or will move to another network. There are plenty of other networks that accept uh, or that, that can work with ASIC machines. So only the best machines will continue working on the Bitcoin blockchain that has always been like that. <clears throat> Just to remind you back in 2013 when somebody came up with the ASIC for the first time, all those uh, GPS miners, uh, GPU miners, sorry, the GPU miners were obsolete and could be switched off because none of them were really mining any Bitcoins anymore. Um, so it, life will continue. And uh, also, if let's say a substantial amount of Bitcoiners switch off their machines, then as it's currently happening with the time, the time will be inverted. So it will take longer than 10 minutes to mine a Bitcoin, and, uh, to, um, uh, to mine a block. And, uh, and after 2016 blocks, the difficulty will be adjusted anyway, and it will be back to the usual 10 minutes. So there's nothing to worry about. This is a natural... Uh, uh, effect that happens on the blockchain, on the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, and it's not the first time, it's the third time that this is happening now. Uh, but just uh, just take a look out. I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing that's happening because it will reduce the, the subsidy <coughs> or the inflation rate from the Bitcoin blockchain to around only 1.79 percent. Now, the second one will be effect will be really is, is a really interesting one. It's called DCEP, and it's translated into Digital Currency Electronic Payment. And that is the renminbi of China on a blockchain. So that happened now, as we at Category 5 announced it back in December last year. They have done it now. They're rolling it out, <clears throat> and it will have, I'm pretty sure, global implications. So um, they're gradually replacing the paper money with the blockchain money. And as you probably know from China, if you go to a small market, and you want to buy something very cheap, uh, you don't buy it with cash anymore. You pay there with your cell phone. A little bit like Apple Pay, they have got their systems and everybody has got that over there. They don't, sometimes they don't even accept credit cards anymore. And in future, it will be only this famous DCEP. And uh, you'll see uh, two charts in a second behind me. One is a picture of that uh, cell phone uh, um, application and the other one is just a comparison to cash and and other uh, valuables now <clears throat> they're rolling it out very carefully it's only in, uh, in a few cities where they're rolling it out and testing it they will be uh, involving uh, huge vendors like mcdonald's uh, starbucks uh, that will be testing in these cities um, the the dcep uh, at a stage, every merchant must accept the DCEP uh, because it's the official currency of, uh, of China. It is a blockchain um, based on many uh, things that we know from our blockchain industry will be incorporated in there with the only one big difference, it's centralized. And what does that mean? So if the government in China or the Central Bank of China decides <coughs> to do something, then everybody will have to follow that. And that means that, for example, if they give you some money or you have got some money in your, in your wallet, then they can tell you where to spend it. 
you can't do anything against that because it's not paper anymore. You cannot just go somewhere and pay with cash. You have to pay with a DCEP and they can tell you where to buy it. And um, the question I will be asked, well, what happens with us here? It's the similar, it's going to be similar. Just wait a few years. I mean, not to the extreme that they will tell us uh, what, we're, what to do and not to do with the money, because that will be a little revolution in the Western world. But if the government gives you $1,200, they can decide where to spend, where you, they want you to spend it. And that can be regulated and done through a, a digital currency. So watch out, we'll keep you informed on this here. And that's it uh, from me here at the Crypto Corner. I wish you a fantastic week uh, and that things may pan out the way you want to, them to be panned out. So hope to see you next week. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Robert. Just a reminder, we're not giving you financial advice here on the show. Rather, we're simply giving you the facts and leaving it up to you. And now back to Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Users of a widely used firewall from Sophos have been under a zero-day attack that was designed to steal usernames, cryptographically protected passwords, and other sensitive data. The well-researched and developed attack exploited an SQL injection flow flaw in fully patched versions of the Sophos XG firewall. With that toehold in systems, it downloaded and installed a series of scripts that ultimately executed code intended to make off with users' real names, usernames, the cryptographically hashed form of the passwords, and the salted SHA-256 hash of the administrator account's password. Sophos has delivered a hotfix that mitigates the vulnerability. Other data? Targeted by the attack included an IP address allocation permissions for firewall users, system information such as running OS and version, uptime and network configuration, as well as the ARP tables used to map IP addresses to device MAC addresses. Sophos researchers wrote in Sunday's disclosure, this malware's primary task appeared to be data theft, which it could perform by retrieving the contents of various database tables stored in the firewall, as well as by running some operating system commands. The exploits also downloaded the malware from domains that appeared in the le to be legitimate. To evade detection, some of the malware deleted underlying files that executed it and ran solely in memory. The malicious code uses a creative and roundabout method to ensure it's executed, it's executed each time firewalls are started. Those characteristics strongly suggest that the threat actors spent weeks or months laying the groundwork for the attacks. The data the malware was designed to exfiltrate suggests the attack was designed to give attackers the means to further penetrate the organizations that use the firewall through phishing attacks and unauthorized access to user accounts. The zero-day vulnerability that made the attacks possible was a pre-authentication SQL injection flaw found in the custom operating system that runs the firewall. So folks provided no additional details about the vulnerability. Users of vulnerable firewalls should ensure the hotfix is installed as soon as possible and then examine their systems for signs of compromise published on the Sophos news site. As the fix is part of the automatic e update ecosystem, ensure your firewall has these enabled to receive the fix. A new lightweight virtual reality device has been created that would allow users to touch objects at shops and museums without ever having to go there in the flesh. The limits of virtual reality have been stretched in the last five years. The technology has become the medium of choice for game developers, artists, and actors alike, seeing a real boom in projects that bring us alternate realities during enforced social isolation. Through immersive audio and visual landscapes, the ability to visit mind-blowing locations, real or not, is on the brink of becoming an affordable option for many. Nowadays, what you see and hear in virtual reality is not so dissimilar from actually visiting these places. However, up until now, the experience did not give us the ability to physically interact with surrounding environments. Chris Harrison, assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon's University Human Computer Interaction Institute says, elements such as walls, furniture, and virtual characters are key to building immersive, immersive virtual worlds, and yet contemporary VR systems do little more than vibrate hand controllers. 
A team at the Pennsylvania University has created a new device that uses haptic feedback, a technology which stimulates the sensation of touch to make the virtual experience seem more real. Where other devices might use a series of expensive, power-hungry motors to give the sensation of touch, their design uses a simpler mechanical solution. From a shoulder-mounted system, a string is attached to each finger, giving resistance based on what the user should be feeling. A spring-loaded mechanism is combined with an electric latch that stops the hand from moving further as it makes contact with heavy objects in the virtual world. Kathy Fang, co-author of the study, says, I think the experience creates surprises, such as when you interact with a railing and can wrap your fingers around it. Fang said the system would be suitable for VR games and experiences that involve interacting with physical obstacles and objects, such as a maze. It might also be used for visits to virtual museums. And in a time when physically visiting retail stores is not always possible, she says. You might also use it to shop in a furniture store. While their research shows that this method provides a much more realistic sense of touch, the team says that a mass-produced version, when, re when ready, could be available to the public for less than $50. Google has released the code for their internally developed artificial intelligence, Tapas. It can take a natural language question such as what's the name of the latest iPhone and fetch the answer from a relational database or spreadsheet and it's now open source. The search giant's researchers detailed the AI on Thursday. Tapas is based on BERT, a natural language processing technique that Google uses in its search engine. A sizable portion of the world's information is relational, that is to say organized into rows and columns. Navigating from these rows and columns historically required either manually sif uh, shift sifting through a spreadsheet or writing SQL queries. Natural language processing makes the task considerably easier for users, which is why the technology has been extensively adopted by Google and other players in the analytics market. The search giant says that the tapas beats or matches the three top open source algorithms for parsing relational data. They trained the AI on 6.2 million tables from the English version of Wikipedia and then set it to work on a trio of academic data sets. Benchmark tests that showed that the neural network provides accurate comparable answers as the rival algorithms across all three data sets. The type of language processing Google has implemented into Tapas allows the AI to consider not only the question posed by users and the data they wish to query, but also the structure of the relational tables in which the data is stored. Tapas can go beyond just fetching data and also perform basic calculations. For example, if a business user evaluating sales data asks for the average revenue across their company's three most popular products, the AI would reply with the calculated answer, not just the data set. Tapas is available now on the Google Research GitHub repository. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. We've got to take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to be showing you a way that you can travel the world vicariously through radio stations. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. I said I was going to move into the studio. I'm glad. I mean, okay, so Becca broadcasted the news from the main studio, and that worked flawlessly with the new devices, uh, the HDMI repeaters. I decided I'm going to actually stick around in here because it's so quiet now. It just sounds great. And speaking of sound, I thought I would show you something that just is mind-bending how technology can evolve something that we thought could never get any better and that's radio. Well, when I was growing up, I used Shoutcast like crazy. I still do. Shoutcast.com, it's a great service. Click on the directory and you got radio stations from all over the place. However, here's the thing. Terrestrial radio stations also these days broadcast on the internet. Most of them, if not all of them, do. 
And if that's the case, what would happen if somebody were to aggregate all of the radio stations they can find in the entire world, I'm talking thousands of radio stations, and put them together in a way that has never been done before? That is Radio Garden. Check out Radio Dot Garden. Let's head there now. What is super unique about Radio Garden is that when you start, all right, you ready? Let's start. It's going to find your geolocation on the planet Earth. That's where we are. And it's going to take you to your city and start playing a radio station in your city. Now, I've turned off my speakers because I just don't want the infringement copyright notice and everything else. However, I don't need to give you a tutorial on, on Radio.Garden. It's so intuitive. You're going to figure it out and you're going to find this is just amazing. Hey, there's the radio station Jeff and I used to work at, Life 100.3 in Barrie. So this is an actual globe that you can interact with. So every green dot is in fact a radio station. The, like an FM or AM radio station. We're not talking like, well, there are internet radio uh, radio stations. I should, shouldn't say that. But so what you do is you zoom out and in with your mouse wheel and then move around the globe. So if I wanted to hear in, you know, various areas of the states or if I wanted to actually go overseas, right? And let's say, you know, in, let's go a little south in the UK here. Uh, let's head over to Ipswich. Let's zoom in. And there's Funkur Radio. I don't know if I said it right. Woodbridge, Unique Sessions Radio. So these are radio stations broadcasting. Hey, I don't need to give you the tutorial. Check it out. It's radio.garden. Every single green dot is another radio station. If they're clustered too close together, hey, you've got a list over here and you can click and it will load, and it's so incredibly fast. You can also create a favorites list. You can search. Check it out. I mean, it's intuitive, it's incredible, and, and it loads the radio stations faster than anything I've ever seen before. They've done a fantastic job. Now, this site, this service, is being aggregated by a company in Amsterdam, the, the Netherlands. Um, and uh, there is some information there about them, but they really, like, it's free for all. And uh, there's nothing to it. Do check it out. No fuss, no software to install. Just enjoy radio from all around the world. That's radio.garden. It's all the time that I have for this week, folks, but it's been so great having you here. Thank you for joining me on Category 5 Technology TV. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week. Don't forget we are on Twitter, at Category 5 TV. I personally am on Twitter, if you'd like to follow me, at Robbie Ferguson. I'm incredibly witty. I like to think so. But I hope you'll follow me, and I follow back. <laughs> We're also on Facebook. You can just go to Facebook.com, do a quick search for Cat5TV, or just go Facebook.com slash user slash Cat5TV, Category 5 Technology TV. I mean, we're, we're on all the platforms, but Facebook, we post every week. Um, Twitter, uh, I'm very active on, so that's kind of where you want to go. And of course, here on Category 5 Technology TV's website, Category5.tv, that is the place to be where we're constantly posting brand new shiny videos and uh, we've got some great features there you can download videos as well we've got BitTorrent files that you can download past seasons in bulk to your computer webs right from our website so check it out category5.tv looking forward to seeing you again next week everybody take care see ya